Hi, I'm Govind Jayaraman, and this is Paper Napkin Wisdom. On today's episode, we have Michael Cato. Michael is president and CEO of Restaurants on the Run. Restaurants on the Run delivers over 150,000 meals per month to people around the United States. He is also the former global chairman of the Entrepreneurs Organization, a global community of more than 10,000 entrepreneurs. I actually am a member of this organization, and it has changed my life. Michael is an expert on execution, and he's going to share one of his big secrets with us here today. Let's listen to my conversation with Michael Cato. Mike, welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom. I'm thrilled that you joined me here today. Great to be here, Govan. Thank you for having me. So you have a really interesting paper napkin. I have no idea what it means, but it's going to be a great conversation. I know it. So could I have you read it out loud for everyone listening, please? You bet. Don't forget Dr. Chang and your vital factors. Okay. So <laughs> what does that mean, and why did you choose to share that with me today? Well, Govan, every year I get a physical. And I go see Dr. Chang. And he performs his battery of tests, everything from blood pressure, you know, cholesterol, body fat, weight. You know, sometimes he takes even a little bit of a, you know, a, a deeper, you know, approach to things. But I do this every single year. I go through the testing with him. And then afterwards, I sit down with him. And he says, let's take a look at your numbers or let's take a look at your spreadsheet because he's got it kind of in a document for me with, you could say, like my, my most important, say, 10 to 15 metrics. My, you know, I call them vital factors. So once we look at those, we then proceed to open up last year's spreadsheet, look at those and start comparing. And as we're doing that, we're looking at what I said I wanted to improve last year because every year he wants me to take pick probably about three things and try to move the needle on those three things. So. We look at this year's, we look at last year's, we look at my goals that I set last year, we look at how we did, and then we proceed to set new goals for the next 12 months. And, you know, generally about three, no more than five. And I thought about that as I've been going through that for the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, the question I have to ask myself is why would I treat my business any different than I treat my body? And I use that analogy in the way that I actually run my company. Every month, we don't see Dr. Chang, but my business basically has a physical. Literally 12 times a year, we have a physical on our business. And we get together my executive team, and we look at the 12 to 15 most important metrics that we have in the company. And we look at how we're doing on them, how we're doing versus last month, which ones are, you know, in danger, which ones, you know, are doing well. And that's about a two to two and a half hour process once a month. That's, that's amazing. You know, I mean, one of the things that I, I think is really inspiring, I, first of all, like you're a guy who takes really good care of himself. The fact that, that you know, you, you feel like there are three to five things to work on every year physically for you is, I think, an important takeaway for me. I think what, what's really neat is you're giving your business a full physical every single month. Every single month. And, and as we give ourselves the physical, we're doing a few things. We're, we're, we're seeing if we're aligned, you know, with where we said we wanted to be for the year. Um, we're, we're also equally important. We're also, you know, every, every one of those lines on that spreadsheet has someone, every one of those vital factors has someone's name on it that sits in that meeting. So there's, you know, complete accountability right there. So everybody knows if there's an issue, we know who owns it. We can set corrective action steps right there. In fact, every month we actually set goals. So just like I do with my body once a year, once a month, once we, once we, when we do this physical every month, we actually, each, each one of us are setting three, four goals for ourselves for the next 30 days. So not only do we review the spreadsheet in that meeting, but we also review the goals and the controls, as we call them, from the previous month for each individual, and then we set new goals and controls for the next 30 days. So we're always building not only accountability, but momentum. So uh, that's, that's incredible. I, and I, I like I like the fact that you're talking about goals and controls because to me when you're saying that, I, I hear goals as being where you see yourself being in 30 days, but the controls are how you're measuring yourself along the way. You're just not waiting for 30 days to go by 
and, and, and looking around saying, hey, I made it or I didn't, right? No, exactly. We're, you know, listen, there's a lot of different programs out there that create accountability in a company. Some do it monthly, um, like the program I use, you know, with Vital Factors and a company map. Some do it weekly, like, you know, you know, Gazelle's Rockefeller Habits. Either way, they all tie into something bigger, whether it's, you know, probably starting out at the three- to five-year plan or the vision. You're probably thinking BHAG vision. A lot of companies bring that down to what are we doing for three years, then you bring it down to a year. You know, we bring it down to what we're doing every month. And some companies integrate quarterly stuff. We do a little bit of quarterly thing. But you're right. It's We know what we're trying to get done every month by setting goals, which means when I'm sitting and having my my meetings, my direct, my one-to-one coaching sessions with my managers, which I do every two weeks on an individual basis, I'm able to have a conversation about how they're doing and what they said they wanted to get done. And that's the beauty of it. So I'm constantly measuring performance, constantly, you know, reinforcing and, and, and giving coaching where needed, but recognition, you know, when it when it's due. And not only does this happen at the executive level, it happens in every department. So every one of those people that are in that meeting on my executive team, you could almost consider them, each one of them, an important body part of my body, okay? So we're looking at each body part each month in that physical, whether it's marketing, sales, finance, you know, technology. And so each one of them go back to their respective department, their support team, and they run the exact same process for their vital factors for their department. So we're creating that, you know, top to bottom, bottom to top alignment in the organization. And, and you know, the, the thing that's really interesting about it, and I think that a lot of people struggle with, with versions of accountability because it feels like, you know, certainly as entrepreneurs, one of the reasons why we start companies is to get away from some accountability. So I, I think it's really powerful what you've done is create an accountability system within your organization around these vital factors where each body part is managing itself to a certain degree and, and doing its thing. And, and you're just setting the parameters for which it needs to, to do that and, and coaching them through it every two weeks. You know, 100%. Okay. And so what's, what's unique about this is that, you know, it's creating a cr- tremendous amount of communication because we're getting together once a month and trying to really break down walls and communicate as a group where, you know, linking what we're all doing to where we're trying to go and make sure that performance is being managed. That's what's really incredible about it. What, if you get a layer down in my organization though, into my operations department, we take it one slight, a slight step further. You know, we operate in nine different markets in the U.S. and, um, when, our, my, when my operations teams gets together, they all fly in literally every single month. All, gen, all nine general managers fly to Orange County, California, and they sit face-to-face, and they run their meeting as peers, kind of like we do in EO and YPO. And that's the unique twist that I really like about this. We've chosen to make, make sure that they're all meeting face-to-face to have that conversation. Investment. I mean, and, and if we draw it back to uh, where you started with Dr. Chang, I mean, you're, you're summoning all your resources when you're taking care of yourself, right? I mean, you're summoning all those body parts have got to work together. You can't just sit there and, for example, work on your right arm without working on your left. Right. So, so all those places, pieces have to be together. And, and even when you think about a strength training now, you're talking about, people talk about working on your core and all that kind of stuff. You can't do that without bringing everything together. So, so that's, I see why you're doing that. Now, that's a huge commitment. Isn't there a little bit of a pushback around that? I mean, I'm, I'm, it, doesn't it – don't people say it, it robs them of productivity, all that time going back and forth? No, I don't think so because, you know, I, here what we're really doing is I think about my body and for fitness. And to commit to fitness, you need to commit to rituals. In fact, I think in life, to commit to getting anything done in life and, and actually – creating time and space and freedom for yourself, rituals are the absolute key. We do, it in our, we do it in our children's lives. We see ourselves doing it. We all know what creates accountability to get things done in fitness. You know, you need to do it at the same time, you know, every day, five days a week, six days a week. You can even step, another, step it up another level if you have a trainer or an accountability partner or a buddy that you work out with. Those things work. So why not apply them in your business? So these meetings are just simply rituals that happen with peer-to-peer accountability with a coach or facilitator in the meeting and that communication by getting things done in that meeting it actually creates more flexibility and more freedom for the employees because they're not running around from place to place they've got their meeting once a week where we can deal with the issues that need to be dealt with and then move on with action steps and accountability so let me let me ask you about this i mean 
Like a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs are. We, we've heard the we've heard all the adages, right? We're rebels. We're rule breakers. We're renegades. Uh, we we don't take the rules nicely. We don't like routine. We don't like schedule. That's why we do what we do. We do it so we can we can carve our our own way. But you're 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 saying that rituals that hap, rituals have to happen in order in order for all of that other free, stuff to be free, right? Mm, totally. Burn harness. He used to have a saying, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was like rad- radical, you know, structure creates radical flexibility. And it's true. I mean, it's a, it, it doesn't seem – it seems kind of – it's hard to get your head around, but the more structure you have in place, like I said, I think children are a great example of that. The more structure you have in fa- place, the more actual flexibility. You can change faster, put it that way. When we have rituals for communication, you know, and accountability in our business, it allows us to stay on the same page, and it allows us – to actually change quicker because we're all moving in the same direction. So if something changes in the marketplace, we're kind of all seeing it together. And we're already at a point of clarity or understanding when that happens, which allows us to make quicker decisions. Well, that makes sense. And and so how much transparency is there across all of the layers of your company, you know, from in that management meeting across those 12 or 11, you said 10 to 12 vital factors, right? So how, how open is it there? It's total open. So, so we have complete transparency in the business. You know, everyone in the company, we have a profit sharing plan. Um, but basically everybody from, you know, the front line to the CEO, we know how the company is performing on a profitability basis, uh, every single month. And so what's neat about this process and with that transparency is that every line on our profit and loss statement has a name attached to it. So if something's going awry, a byproduct, of all of this is that if something is going awry in the financial statement, there's not much to say because the person's name is right there and we always know who owns it and they need to get it back in place. So um, let's talk about that. You know, when someone drops the ball and and because there's a profit sharing plan and and it's fully transparent, you know, does that person get ostracized or or how does that work? No, I mean, the, the, the organization has become pretty good at, at, you know, at managing to these P&Ls. And if there's a reason that something went awry, it's generally, you know, we trust each other and people understand that, you know, that that person or that department is probably going to get it back in line, you know, by the end of the quarter. So there's a lot of trust that goes into it. Um, and like I said, it's, it's taken some time to get to this point where, you know, they're actually very good at that at the expense, um, you know, budgeting process. I mean, I think last year I mean, we were within – one percent of about a four to five million dollar expense budget, and uh, that was pretty impressive, actually. Yeah, that is really impressive. And and you know, for, for people who who may not be familiar with your business and and, and your operation, I mean, you, you're you're virtually nationwide. I mean, you're, you're a nationwide company. Uh, how hands on are you? I mean, when you're talking about all the structure and you know, talking about radical structure, you're talking about managing this like you manage your body. How hands-on do you have to be as part of all of that? Well, I think, you know, I think it's, it's always, you're always tempted to, especially as an EO or, you know, an YPO, or you're always tempted to, at least I am, overcomplicate things because you see so many cool ways of, of executing in your business and devising strategy, and it's, there's so many great tools now. But, you know, you, you asked me earlier about, the, about people buying in. Once you get the buy-in from the team, you know, and if you don't have buy-in on structure and accountability, those people probably won't last. But once you get the buy-in, it starts to manage itself because it's just – it's a rhythm, and it's happening every single month, at the, you know, at, at certain times. So as far as my, my hands-on, I try to stay – I stay to, I try to stay involved in, obviously, these meetings, of course. You know, and I try to spend my time coaching my people, and I actually will go a layer down into the leadership group and spend some time with, with you know, up-and-coming leaders who are running strategic projects for the organization. So most of my time is spent – in those type of in that type of environment. So, so would you say that you know in, in this type of leadership style, and and I love the you know thinking about these vital factors for your body and, and associating it with the business, but in this type of style, you know really what you're trying to do is influence great leadership within the organization, right? Well, there's no question we're trying to you know, we're trying to develop and challenge the leadership team and the, and the future generations of leaders. And so I think my role in that is to build, is to keep the organization aligned. You know, when I traveled, when I was a chairman for with the global chair for EO, 
you know, one of my biggest learnings was that as the CEO, I have a job. You know, I have a job. I can sit there and tell you I have a great team and process this and process that and, you know, but as the CEO, I have a job and people look to me, you know, and, and it might just be to look to me for, to know that everything's going to be okay, to know that there is a vision and that there is a CEO that's engaged, that's funk, that's trying to align the organization. And, that, and that's kind of what I do in those meetings. I try to coach people, help them, help, help connect them to the why, not only of the company, but the why of what, why, the why of why we're doing certain things and how they interlink with other bigger strategies that we're working on as well. So let's let's go back to this body analogy. Has your has your business always been healthy in those vital factors? I mean, was did this come naturally to you? Did this system and structure and rhythm and all this stuff come naturally to you? What, what did you do to get here? Absolutely not. See, you know, probably about twelve. Well, it's probably fourteen years ago. You know, I realized that I needed to make a change. You know, that I needed to become a, a different kind of CEO that I needed to become what I call now the entrepreneurial CEO. In fact, this tip, this Dr. Chang analogy is actually tip number eight when I speak about the 10 tips for becoming an entrepreneurial CEO. So this wasn't easy. This was actually my biggest danger, which, which was I, I, as driven as I was, uh, I didn't have the, the ability to create an organization, you know, that had structure and accountability, like I know we needed to have in order to scale and do what we wanted to do. So I found the company that could help us and the coach that could help us, and that's when I brought someone in that, you know, my personal coach I've had now since that point, and he works with my, he's been working with my executive team basically monthly for, you know, since that day 12, 13, 14 years ago. I I needed help is the bottom line. And the business was not healthy at the time. And, and I think that's really powerful. I think a lot of a lot of us as CEOs, a lot of us as entrepreneurs, don't realize how much we need to ask for help. I mean, you needed to ask for help. You, you can't give yourself a physical, right? You can't you can't take care of your body in that way. We go to see a doctor, and in our business, I think what you're saying is you went to see a coach. Well, I actually saw my forum, and my forum, you know, had I ended up recommending somebody to me. But yeah, I I went and saw my coach, which was my doctor. That's a great great way to think of it. And he, uh, you know, he helped me diagnose the issue and and you know get the accountability of staying on track and and the momentum of moving in the right direction. So so let's talk about the transition period. When, you know, when you first started to, to build in that structure, that's build in that accountability for yourself and and get radical with your own structure and change the way you worked. How hard was that? Well, that's a work in progress. So, um, you know, obviously transitioning from micromanaging and being in the middle of everything to, to being more of a coach and trying to make sure that you got the right players on the field, so to speak, moving in the right direction. I mean, I think it's hard for any entrepreneur. It was hard for me. You know, I'm glad I made it because there's there's no possible way that I could be sitting here with this company and now challenging myself to make sure that the company that I'm ahead of that my development is 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 far enough ahead of the company in order to take it to where it needs to go. And, and who knows? I mean, the company grows and, you know, there might be a time where I have to bring in a new kind of coach, which is the coach that actually runs the company. And I learn from. Yeah. So, so what what. You know, I think one of the things that's really amazing, Mike, is that you're 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 really humble about what you've achieved and 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 you've achieved so much. Uh, so let's let's just talk about when you when you think about your role today and you take it seriously. I, I, I know you take leadership and being a CEO very seriously. Does the structure help you know what you're supposed to be doing too? I mean, sometimes. My mystery is, okay, what am I supposed to do here? There's no diagram. There's no job description of what I have to do here. Uh, does, does the structure help you answer that question sometimes? I think the structure helps from a standpoint that it keeps it keeps me focused on the right things to be focused on. So it it allows me to look at the right numbers and not you know dig deeper where I need to. So from that perspective, yeah, it helps me to keep, make sure that the meetings that I'm having with my people are focused around the right things. Because these vital factors are the, they're the numbers that are going to either hold your business back or propel it forward. So if I've got the right numbers, and believe me, that's not easy. And I, till right now, every day I'm thinking, is this the right number or is this the right way to measure that number? What are we missing? Do we have enough leading indicators, predictive? But if I've got, as the more, the closer I get to those numbers being the right numbers, then I can have better conversation 
with my people, more focused conversation. So it does help me work from that perspective. So you're always looking at that too, right? I, and I, I guess to a certain degree, I just thought that the numbers were the numbers. And but you're you're saying that the numbers that you're measuring, the things that the ten to twelve things that you're measuring, are are always under evaluation. Yeah, I think you know. For example, you know, I look at one of the most important things in our business. You know, since we're our customer is a corporate customer, and our supply chain are restaurants, we basically deliver food from restaurants to co- companies um, in different markets in the U.S. You would think on time is pretty important, and it is. Are we on time? What percentage of the time are we on time with the order? We're always looking at that because what does that mean exactly? Does that mean on time when it's set up for the customer, or does it mean when we show up at the door? And what about if, you know, you know, how the customer thinks about it, their perception of it. So we're constantly evaluating what's the right way to look at it. Now you throw technology into it. So now we, we're becoming less dependent on on the people piece of it, telling us when they're done or where they're at. And now technology can do a lot of that with location services and so on and so forth. So we're always looking at, you know, not only is this the right thing to measure, but are we measuring it the right way? That's interesting. So, I mean, if we, if we, if we draw the analogy further and we, and we think about, you know, understanding the health of that body part, you know, how, how do you assess the health of those key people in your organization? Because I, I, I'd imagine that that's an important part of all of this as well. I mean, the, the first way, you know, just like in your body, any particular body part, the doctor, and Dr. Chang, if he's looking at my, at my heart, you know, he might be looking at, you know, my, my resting heart rate or another, or an, another metric. We just look, we basically, the, the first assessment is the performance against their goals. So how are they doing on, the, on their vital factors, the goals that they're setting for their vital factors? How are they performing against them on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis? That's the very first place that we start. That's, that's, that's great. So let's talk about someone. Let's, 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 let's talk about one, you know, one of those organs, one of those, one of those key people, one of those managers that comes into those meetings that has had ongoing challenges. You know, what's the kind of coaching that you give them to help them through that? Well, <clears throat> One of the things that we can do real time is if a manager is having a problem, let's say someone from marketing comes in and he's having a problem with new business retention. Okay, so these are the the businesses that come in one month and perhaps we're not retaining a high percentage of them the following month. What we can do right at that point is we're always looking to to to, to help him come out of there with an action plan. So we'll take we'll have a timed exercise called a team consult where he'll frame the problem and what his goal is for what he's trying to accomplish with that with that particular metric, tell a little bit of the backstory. He'll take a couple minutes with that. And then we go around the room and do a brainstorm. You know, no, no, we're not debating. Just we go right around the room and everybody says what their idea may be. And we keep doing it until, we keep doing that until we run out of ideas. And that generally takes about four to five minutes and you basically are out of ideas, which is amazing when you think about how long winded things get when you put a topic on the table that needs to be discussed. So within four to five minutes, all the topics are out. Then the owner of that, you know, metric will take some time, look at the list, read it back, and then pick the two or three action steps he's going to take over the next 30 to 60 days in order to try to get that metric back on track. That's fantastic. And, and I, I mean, that, that by itself is a huge tip because I can just see communication barriers falling in that process, right? I mean, that, that every, everybody's together in that moment. Yep. Yep, and it's just it's a, gr- a great way so that, you know, you know, he might fine-tune it with his team, so he could go use that same process with his team and see if the results are the same, you know, and then they can they can take a couple action steps and, and see how things go. That's really great. That's really great. So let, let, let's, let's, let's draw the analogy further on the, on, you know, you see, so you see Dr. Chang every year um, and, and have your vital factors checked. You set three to five goals. And, you, and you're doing the same process in your business every single month, and that's moving forward. You know, how how do you do that in a in a bigger way annually to reassess where you're going to go against your your BHAG, your big hairy audacious goal, or or whatever vision you have for the future? And 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 then the the same sort of point is how do you deal with massive changes that occur and sideswipe you? let's say, and take you off, off plan. Yeah. Um, I mean, those are, those are, I, I, those, those, that process is, uh, you know, I'm constantly tweaking and evaluating how that works. The first part of your question is the annual. 
what we, you know, three years ago when I came back from being the chairman of EO globally, we spent like basically a series of retreats over the summer of 2010, I believe, or 2011, I should say, 10 or 11, I can't remember, the summer. And we built our, we ended up building a strategy statement, which is really zeroing in on you know, who the customer is and, you know, what our value proposition is. But we proceeded to put in, you know, three-year targets for the business. So that gave us kind of a roadmap. And so now every year what we go back is we refer, and when I say targets, I mean, we took our, probably our, what we considered at the time the five most important vital factors to be goal setting against. And we goal set against those throughout three years. So every year when we would come back, we knew the targets of where we wanted to go. And so the annual process would be really taking a look at kind of the, the SWOT analysis, the bit SWOT analysis of the business, so we can get a kind of a perspective of what's happening in the industry. This is to your second question. We're trying to always kind of trying to take a look at, you know, what are the what is going on in our industry? What are the the forces, as Michael Porter would call them, that are impacting them now and that could potentially impact them in the future? That allows us to start thinking about, hey, how do we make our current business better? But oh, what are some things we need to start working on right now that kind of are around the corner? to make sure that we're staying ahead of the curve. So by looking at the industry profile on a regular basis and kind of referring back to where we're trying to go with our BHAG, it helps us to make decisions and move along a little bit quicker. But we don't just do it annually, just just for the record. We we actually are having tough conversations about the business, you know, on a monthly basis. So in addition to my executive team, I also bring another group, which I call the executive council, and we, we're now meeting – Twice, every other week, basically twice a month. And we meet, and the point of that meeting is just to have conversation, to have dialogue. I'll throw a topic on the table for us to discuss. And we, we talk about strategy on a regular basis. Who's the customer? And so we're constantly, literally monthly, getting the key leadership in the organization together, and we're just communicating and talking and trying to continue to build consensus and alignment and also create some environment for, for debate and discussion so that as we start to get towards, well, what's the plan for next year, we've been thinking about that all year. That's more of a process. It's just not some event we do in October. That, that's, that's incredible. And, and, you know, to that second point, I bet you that makes you pretty nimble, right, when something comes along? Yeah, it can. I mean, it really can. And uh, because people, like I said, because the radical rhythms create that radical level of, of communication and alignment. And the alignment doesn't mean, oh, we're all sitting in a room agreeing. It means that we're aligned in direction. And there's been debate along the way that says, OK, well, this is the direction, even though there's debate around it. But this is where we're going. And so, you know, we don't get caught on the left field when if I was to come in and say, well, we have this opportunity in front of us. Chances are they have a pretty good idea of where it came from and why it might be something we should look at. Well, that sounds awesome. Uh, Mike, I could talk to you forever, So, uh, but our, our time today is up. Hopefully yeah. I can bring you back. What do you think? I think it would be great. That, that this is fun just talking about that one thing. I love it, and I've got nine other things that I love to talk about. That sounds awesome. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. It was an honor. What a great conversation with Mike. I mean, he's got so much energy, and he does so much. And I think that his ingredients are incredible. When you think about bringing your team together that frequently, and, and we're talking about a national company, so he's bringing people in from all over North America. And when he's bringing those people into his office around assessing the company's vital factors, assessing the company's health like a checkup, think about an annual exam and how invasive that is, Personally, well, they do the same thing for their company every single month. How profound is that? And it's amazing and certainly no surprise that his company has grown significantly over the last several years. If you'd like to join in the conversation, please log on to papernapkinwisdom.com. Alternatively, you can follow along on Twitter at WiseNapkin, but definitely like our Facebook page. Just look for Paper Napkin Wisdom. And the reason why you want to do that is because you get sneak peeks about who we've got on the show coming up and other sneak peeks as to what's going on in Paper Napkin Wisdom land. Last but not least, if you want to ignite your leadership journey, please join me at Paper Napkin Wisdom Leadership Academy. That's pnwleadershipacademy.com. There you can get the best lessons that come out of the Paper Napkin Wisdoms 
in short, less than 10 minute snippets that can help to ignite not only your leadership journey, but that of your companies. My name is Govan J. Raman. Thank you for listening and make it a great day.